Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful invite, Dave, and thank you for the invitation to come and speak here today. I was perusing the table when I got in and I stumbled across this old dinosaur. So 10 years ago, NSWA, anybody? Who was working on NSWA stuff? All right, Candace, right on. So Sherry Wellenden and Doug Russell and Curtis Horning and folks like that uh, involved with NSWA. And that was the very first state of the watershed report ever to be done in the province. And later that year, Bull Basin Council helped them out with theirs. And they did their first state of the watershed report. So this is the, the one of the very first state of the watershed reports. And of course, this is back when the water for life just got going. Lauren loses a glimmer in Lauren Taylor's eye, the environment minister. So very proud of this document. And of course, why am I holding that up? Well, a lot of the work that we did further for lots of other watershed groups and lots of other lake groups, and of course the Sturgeon River State of the Watershed Report 2012, and a lot of the same approaches, indicators that we developed back then in 2004. A lot of those indicators that we developed then are still being used. The province actually wrote a handbook for how to do State of the Watershed Reporting. It was largely based on Curtis's experience and how we did that. So this is some pretty seminal work, and I'm super proud of it. And of course, this is what led to a lot of the work for the Sturge uh, project that we did. Um, but yeah, I've been involved with the Alberta Water Council for the past 10 years, and I've been involved with the Alberta Lake Management Society for the past 20 years. 20 years? Can you believe it? Alberta Lake Management Society has been around for 20 years. So lots of lake water quality reports we've done for them, and, and I've been a board member for them, and I've been on the Water Council for 10 years, so that's super exciting as well. Uh, yeah, I just uh, sort of tip my hat to this. So the province released a state of the watershed reporting guidebook document. And of course, this is largely based off uh, Curtis Horning and, and his staff's experiences with doing some of this early on state of the watershed work. And we wanted to come up with a, a plan for how we should all be doing state of the watershed reporting so that we were all on the same page. We were all using similar indicators and had similar approaches because there's no point in North Sask doing a state of the watershed report that says things are great and somebody else uses completely different indicators and says maybe things aren't so great or between basins we can do some comparisons so that was all outlined by the province when did that come in 2008 so that's sort of uh, midway along in the process i guess so what do i want to talk to you about today well i want to talk to you about this other shiny report that you may have found uh, at the at the reference desk on the way in it's a state of the watershed report for the sturgeon river watershed in particular so uh, what do we talk about in this? Obviously, current conditions in the watershed, some cumulative impact work. We talk about critical or emerging environmental, economic, or social issues. Of course, we want to identify uh, data or knowledge gaps. We want to talk about the indicators that are used to monitor and assess the health, and then any mechanisms currently in place or required to be in place to maintain and protect the watershed. So, all sorts of discussion today, uh, again, uh, getting back to uh, uh, mayor's comments, uh, some of the other uh, speaker's comments on, you know, what are the big issues about water? Well, these are, these are top of mind, these are fairly seminal things that we talk about stormwater in the water. So we're going to roll all that up and put this into one spot into this report for us. So the Sturgeon River watershed, I'm sure everyone, has lots of familiar faces in the room, and I'm sure everyone is very familiar with the Sturgeon River watershed. Of course, it's a sub-watershed of the NSR watershed in central Alberta. This is a non-glacial fed prairie river, which changes its hydrology, which changes it dy its, its dy uh, dynamics compared to other systems like the Bow or the North Saskatchewan itself. These rivers have two freshets, right? You got your spring pulse, your spring snow melt, and then later on in June, the glaciers start to melt, all that headwater water, and you get a second pulse. So if you're a fly fisherman on the Bow, you will know if you want to get on the bow in May when all those big fish are in the river before that June pulse comes through and mucks, mucks up your water again, right? But a prairie watershed that doesn't have that glacial feed, there's only one freshet. So you only get one pulse. You get that one hit of snow melt, and then of course there's some seasonal precipitation, but you just get the one freshet. So that, it changes its dynamics a little bit. It has very high flow variability. You've got your peak flows in the spring, and then extended periods of low flow during summer and fall. And of course, this is a ground-fed river. We've heard that earlier already, the importance of groundwater. That question was raised earlier, so very key points. So yeah, that base flow is all uh, groundwater contribution, so very important stuff. And if we've, <clears throat> if we've contaminated our groundwater with uh, you know, agricultural chemicals, you're going to see that in the base flows of your water. That'll turn up when we do our, our water chemistry sampling. 
And of course, this is one of 12 watersheds uh, that comprise the North Saskatchewan River proper. And we are all aware of the watershed itself, and there's actually quite a fantastic GIS map of the Sturgeon River watershed in the roll-up, the mini document, uh, the sort of indicators of the watershed. And you get a sense it's uh, four, different, four, dis four different municipalities, right? Four different players at board, four different sets of rules about planning and land use and development. So you've got to get, when this group gets together now, we've got to get four players at the table to talk about Land use, development, plan, 11. Okay, so we have 11 in total. Thank you, Liam. Four, four of the major players, obviously, on the terms of the county side. What is ironic in all of this? You gotta get 11 players to the table? There's only one MGA. There's only one municipal government act. And that's the rule book that all of these people have got to play from. So it's really interesting to me, why do we have all these different densities and all these different things when there's one MGA that's directing the traffic there? I'll leave that sort of maybe for questions at the end something to chew on. <clears throat> so from my side, I'm a professional biologist and a doctor now. Thank you, Dave. Uh, yes, love it, Dr. J. Uh, this is a class C fish bearing water course. Why does that matter to me? Well, that matters in terms of activities going on in the watershed. And as a biologist, if you come to me with a development application, I'm going to tell you that you can't be in that water course between April 16 and June 30th. Why? Because that's sensitive fish spawning habitat. And we do have uh, we do have sport fish in there, so under the federal fisheries regulations, that is protected. So uh, we've got northern pike, we've got walleye and whitefish in particular, right? Because now our Fisheries Act says that we need to protect fisheries of a recreational, commercial, or aboriginal importance, of which obviously these are. It is difficult for this water body to sustain significant populations of game fish during the winter. We have low flow and we have minus 35 degree winters. So things freeze right to the bottom or we've got low flow or very shallow conditions. So uh, winter kill is often an issue in these uh, shallow water bodies. So what is the current condition of the watershed? Well, to let all the air out of the tires, uh, the overall roll up says that uh, the overall health is fair. Now this is based on an average of 15 indicators. Three of those were ranked as good. Five of those were ranked as fair. Three of those are ranked as poor, and four had insufficient data, which is a, a big problem. And this, this always causes quite a bit of excitement when we're sitting around the table doing this kind of work. Well, geez, Dave, you know that four of these indicators don't have any data. Let's just take them out of the equation. We'll just put them back here. We don't need to report on those. Let's just report on eight indicators, or, or, or let's just report on 11 indicators instead of 15. Why would I not want to do that? It's not equal, that's, more importantly, we need to know what those indicators are. They're very important for determining health. I don't just want to shovel them out of the equation because we don't have data on them. As a matter of fact, I want to bring it to your attention and your attention and your attention today that we don't have data on those things. And man, we're doing all this huge planning right now, and there's a whole scarcity of data that we're basing those decisions on. So if I'm doing an environmental impact assessment, I'm gonna to have to come back and say, well, geez, yeah, we know about a lot of these things, but there's still a lot of data gaps. And from a risk management perspective, I think we need to sit up and pay attention and we need to be collecting the data to fill those gaps. Further to my story, the entire world has just changed. So, up till last year, for the North Saskatchewan River watershed, where's Dave? How many long-term river monitoring stations did Alberta Environment have on the North Saskatchewan River? Four-ish, yeah, four. How many do they have now? None. Alberta government has now gotten out of the business of doing monitoring. Where'd it go, Jay? Anybody? It's gone over to Amera. All the monitoring done is being done now by a non-government organization called Amera. So all of your monitoring now is being done by that group. So if I want special watershed information on the sturgeon, I don't go to the province anywhere. I've now got to go over to Amera and ask them, hey guys, would you mind please uh, adding some water chemistry data to your program this year? I'll park that thought as well, because we can have a debate about that. So that insufficient data thing causes me some grief, and the, the, some of the new monitoring pieces also causes me some grief, but I'll park those for everybody today too. Uh, Wetland Inventory Ducks Limited Canada found 6.8% of the Sturgeon River watershed to be composed of permanent and temporary wetlands. Well, we know in this <laughs> province, approximately 20% of the landscape is covered in wetlands, so we're, we're low. And uh, by looking at the amount of glacials that we have in the landscape, which is water, uh, wetland soils, 
we know that we used to have a whole lot more. So I'm going to guess that, like the provincial average, we've probably lost 70% of the wetlands in this watershed. Well, what does that mean? Well, everybody in this room is well aware of the ecological goods and services that wetlands provide. So we've, those are kidneys, right? So imagine losing 70% of your kidneys, and we're taking the landscape's ability away to perform those ecological goods and services like keep water clean, groundwater recharge, get pesticides out of water, all those good things that wetlands do. 70% of those is missing from this watershed. Cumulative impacts. Well, we've heard all, all about the high population growth rate already this morning, so I don't need to belabor that. Of course, I was talking about this, we were talking about this in this report in 2012. So this, uh, me coming here and talking about this report, I'm about three years out of date here talking about it, but it's a, it's a starting point. Uh, high population growth rate, particularly in the major communities. We've got increased anthropogenic disturbances, and of course, we, we were on some pretty big growth curves from 2001 to 2006. And of course, this area is higher than the average for the entire province. And of course, this is why we started up the capital region in the first place, to deal with this growth, the footprint, and the impacts, right? We've also got increased agricultural development and practices. In some of the lake watershed reports that we've done in a 10-year period, 50% of the tree cover was removed. Why? Price of beef was awful, and so folks were expanding their acreages any way that they could to try and get more head on the landscape so they could make, um, you know, make that money back in terms that they were losing on the, on the price of beef. Uh, an increased recreational use, of course, as well. And of course, everybody wants to have that low density development. They want to have that country residential feeling. And it's the same sort of experience that we see uh, across the northern part of the province. And, and we've dealt with a lot of this, Quality's dealt with a lot of this with Lac La Biche, which is why we came up with that riparian setback matrix model and done some work with densities on, with them as well. So what are the critical emerging impacts? Well, increased industrial influences, developments, and disturbances. Obviously, we're having this huge, this is a huge hub of growth. So this is, keeping an eye on this is, is what, uh, it's gonna be front and center for your state of the watershed report here too. We also saw lots of linear development. We hear a lot about linear development. What does this all mean? We put a area to that, total area of almost 80 square kilometers, or 3%, almost 3% of the total land base. And when we get up to 3% uh, disturbance on the landscape is when we start to see impacts to the aquatic environment, serious impacts. And when you get to 4%, uh, very serious impacts to the aquatic environment. So we're, we're halfway there with lots more growth being planned. So, and every time we build roads, we cross water. And whenever we cross water with roads, sediment, salts, all sorts of things are going into that water course from this crossing, not just during the construction of it, uh, but also during the, just the ongoing use and, and maintenance of it. So um, I did a, a paddle trip down the North Saskatchewan River, and there's yet another big bridge uh, going across right now. So they're, they're, and, and as well as the new one at, uh, right, right in downtown at Epcor too. So two huge bridges being put across the North Saks even right now. Lots of mines, lots of pits, lots of landfills, uh, auto wreckers and, lumber, and, and a lumber yard in the, in the Sturgeon River uh, watershed as well. So what are the data gaps that need to be filled in? Riparian area health, that was one of our biggest ones. Andrew came from Cows and Fish. He can tell you all about his experiences. Sorry? Alberta Fish and Game. Sorry, but you work a lot with Cows and Fish, right? Yeah, sorry, my apologies. But you're well aware of the riparian health. We did a lot of riparian health work back in the day. Talking about those sort of issues, and that was, that was always a, a sticking point. And there's lots of really innovative tools now, and I love how technology has come in and filled this gap because we used to fly it with an ultralight. Uh, now we can use um, drones and uh, get capture high, high definition videography with drones, right? You fly a water course with drones and get high definition video and, and do some of that repair and health assessments. And that's super exciting. Surface water quality data. We do not have enough long term consistent numbers to do a proper uh, uh, surface water quality index. So like David mentioned, the, the whole North Saskatchewan River itself only has four stations that were able to do this because of that nice consistent data that's collected over time. We don't have that for the sturgeon. Uh, aquatic macrophytes, we need a widespread survey throughout the watershed. Benthic invertebrates, some work on that needs to be done. And then of course a big gap is wetland inventory. And we've, we're, we're estimating that up to 70% of the wetlands uh, in the watershed have already been lost. When we talk about ecological goods and services, that's kind of crisis stuff. So a lot of attention needs to be paid to wetland inventory immediately. And we need to get a, a sense of, 
Uh, what are the wetlands that we've lost? So possibly doing a drained wetland inventory. So that's work that Ducks Unlimited does day in, day out, and get a sense of what are the priority wetlands that we should be putting back on the landscape. So as our new wetland policy rolls forward, we have a new wetland policy as of June 2015 this year, right? Everybody's well aware of that, brand new wetland policy. And some of the tools that are available under that new wetland policy, we should be able to uh, start addressing some of these losses. So what were the indicators that we used to assess the health of the watershed? Uh, land use, we looked at land use as well. This is a map of uh, cropping density. And we've got uh, what we sort of went with, with healthy and unhealthy, anything greater than 20, anything greater than 90% crop intensity. Uh, we looked at that, that was unhealthy, and less than 60% is healthy. That's the split in the watershed. So you've got the whole eastern side of the watershed, very crop heavy. So we've got low biodiversity, we've got lots of wetland losses, and we've got lots of impacts to the water courses because of that cropping activity. There's just no getting around it. Wherever you've got high agricultural activity, you're going to have a high impact on your surface water bodies. No doubt about it. And quite possibly on your groundwater bodies as well. But again, groundwater is another big gap uh, that we had in this study. Uh, water quality, uh, we used uh, the typical suite of water quality indicators. And we already know uh, there's lots of consistent trends that are exceedance of provincial guidelines for bacteria, E. coli, nitrogen, and phosphorus. I don't need to be a rocket scientist. I don't need to know anything about your watershed. All I need to know is your agricultural intensity. And Melissa, if you could pop back to that last slide. All I need to know is ag intensity, right? Total number of, of head of cattle, poultry, pigs, sheep, goats. We can drag that down into manure units. And if I know my manure density, one of the fun things we did and this report was the poo maps. Everybody loves talking about the poo maps. Billy loved the poo maps. And it was egg intensity. And I even put it as brown in the maps, which was kind of fun. So the browner your watershed was, uh, the higher the higher egg intensity you've got. And of course, for the next slide, it's going to be the poor water quality you have. It's so, it's so well studied and so well linked together. And Jamie White has, has done that work. And Sarah DePoe and folks like that have done that over at Alberta Agriculture with the uh, uh, long-term ag water quality data use uh, study that they did over at Alberta Agriculture in the early 2000s. And that study ended three or four years ago, but it's so links uh, ag intensity and water quality, it's, it's, it's flawless in its relationship. And that relationship plays out here in Sturgeon. Uh, other indicators used to monitor the health, water quantity indicators. So we looked at water allocations by sector and groundwater diversion. Uh, 10 million cubic meters of groundwater allocated annually. Uh, the vast majority of the Sturgeon River watershed land base functions as a groundwater recharge area. So this is some work that was done by hydrogeological consultants uh, well, 15 years ago now. Uh, there is lot, plenty of areas in your watershed, and I apologize, your watershed is the area in yellow here. It was a big roll up for the province that these guys had data for, but your watershed is the yellow here. Uh, lots of areas in your watershed that are at increased risk for groundwater contamination. So where you've got poor soils and shallow groundwater. It's a recipe for water that percolates across the landscape, grabs contaminants, sinks down through that porous soil, and then gets into your groundwater. So uh, several areas. And when we've done the state of the watershed reports and dealt with planners in the past, we, we identify those areas to make sure that keep your intensive livestock operations out of here. Keep your landfills out of these areas because those are high risk for contamination. And also increased importance for wetlands in those areas, right? So if wetlands are drained in those areas, we want to make sure we put those wetlands back on the landscape so they can continue, continue to provide the, the filtration role that ecological goods and services that they provide. <coughs> Finally, uh, we looked at biological indicators, so vegetation types, aquatic macrophytes, fish and benthic invertebrates. Well, um, we know as well that we're in a high agricultural int uh, intensity area. So the red is highly at risk. This is a map from uh, the Biodiversity Institute. So biodiversity at risk for the agricultural areas of Alberta. You're in the yellow area. Probably half the watershed, that half that's highly cropped. Very highly at risk for impacts to biodiversity. Again, because of the agricultural intensity that we see there. So the indicator summary, we can walk through each of these separately, but Based on your land use inventory, high, that high cropping area on the whole east side of the watershed, fair linear developments, they're getting high, so that was also a fair. Wetland inventory is fair, but lots of uncertainty, right? We've got lots of wetlands that are missing. 
riparian health, we did not have enough data to even go on. Livestock density, because of the densities of livestock that we see also ranch as a fair because of those, those poo maps, right? Surface water quality index, we don't have a long-term monitoring set of monitoring stations to go off of. That's a big gap that should be filled. Based on bacteria, the bacteria numbers were pretty good. Nitrogen and phosphorus were poor. Pesticides, however, were good. So the kind of ag activities that we see is largely in the cropping side, and the densities of, of ag aren't as high as, say, as we would see in the Lacombe area, or the Lethbridge area, that Battersea drain area. Water quantity indicators, uh, not, not huge water allocation, so that was rated as good. Groundwater diversions were rated as fair, because we get most of our diversions from groundwater. Vegetation types uh, were poor, obviously, because we've knocked down a lot of the native vegetation, we, and we're, we're cropping those areas. Aquatic macrophytes we had insufficient data for, and benthic invertebrates we had insufficient data for. So when you roll all these up, the overall health of the Sturgeon River watershed in 2012 uh, was ranked to be fair. So what mechanisms are in place or need to be in place to maintain and protect the watershed? Number one, we need to fill in those data gaps. Okay, who's going to do that? Well, I'm not leaving enough Alberta environment to do it. Um, you know, uh, we've got a a largely uh, tackle that style through the watershed groups, through your municipalities, and through other mechanisms. We want to maintain or improve water quality in the watershed. We want to maintain or improve the water quantity. We want to maintain or improve the aquatic ecosystem health and protect that groundwater quality and quantity. Well, you've got the maps now where groundwater is potentially at risk. So let's, uh, let's make sure that our planners are using that information when they're approving certain uh, developments, especially those ones that are uh, cause, can potentially cause risk to the environment, intensive livestock operations in particular, and make sure that we're putting those in the right places. Align your water and land use planning at the regional scale. And again, we're doing lots of that through land use framework. We're doing lots of that through Water for Life, and we're doing lots of that through the, the watershed associations and, and groups like that with all the folks sitting around the table. So it's super exciting that we're all here today to talk about all of these issues. So I hope this is a uh, this is some, some information for you to use for the rest of the day today. Uh, fun facts, about 10 million cubic meters of groundwater allocated annually. Consumptive use is about 3.4 million cubic meters. With return flows of over 5 million cubic meters, about half a million cubic meters designate, designated as losses. And Andrew, fish and game guy, where, where are all those lake sturgeon? Not what? Were there ever sturgeon in this river? There were, yeah. There were. Fantastic. That's actually a lake, that's a white sturgeon, so I'm cheating a little bit there. So that's a small fish I caught in the Fraser system.